Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Ashok Seth from New Delhi. And we have a very exciting session today at the AICT Asia PCR. This is to do with the challenges of complex PCI treatment, mechanical support in chip patients, and intravascular lithotripsy for calcified coronary artery disease. The sort of real world cases that we see every day in our cath labs and are the most challenging subsets. We have our session objectives and the session objectives are to learn the benefits of protected PCI, when, who, why, and to understand the data. We also want to learn the relevance and application of the PROTECT clinical data and the EAPCI ACRA expert consensus in the real world and hopefully apply to a clinical practice to learn to optimally introduce and adopt intravascular lithotripsy for the treatment of calcified lesions in our real world practice. And we see heavily calcified lesions, which are long, diffuse, bifurcation, left main, and how we need to understand how to apply lithotripsy to this and to learn how to appraise the latest results of the disrupt CAD pool data and assess the in real world clinical data as well to be able to apply to a clinical practice. We have expert panel. We have Professor Flavio Rabicini, who's also my co-chair. He's the chairman of cardiovascular medicine in Verona in Italy. We have Benjamin Horton from Clinical Clinique Pasteur Toulouse in France. We have Professor KKO of the National Heart Center Singapore. And we have Professor Kierfo of the Scientific Institute Rafael Hospital Milan, Italy. With these words, I hand it over to Flavio to give the introduction to this session. Over to you, Flavio. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, thank you, friends. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you here today. And uh, I have no conflicts of interest with this matter. And I will start from three basic points to drive you to a successful, hopefully successful end when uh, uh, dealing with challenges on, with calcified lesions on cheap patients. First one is adequate patient selection to avoid futility. The second one, which might appear to be too obvious, is that the patient must survive the procedure. And the third one is that the operator should be able to perform the procedure according to his plan A. If points one to three are respected, then the patient will live longer and will experience an improvement on his or her quality of life. So let's start from point one. We need to avoid futility because, of course, old age, advanced renal and pulmonary disease, and viable myocardium and severe functional mitral regurgitation will not revert because of the PCI, even if it is technically successful. Then patient selection is the first step. The second one is that the patient might survive the procedure. And we know that patients with poor contractility or hemodynamic compromise needing complex percutaneous procedures may crash in a matter of a few minutes. And circulatory support is the way to maintain hemodynamic stability, which means the patient alive, during the performance of this complex and often time-consuming intervention. Point three. We all need to plan our strategy according to the best of our knowledge is what we call the plan A. And we know that calcified lesions can be difficult to treat, requiring more time, exponing to complications and ending with suboptimal results that will impair and worsen the follow-up of these patients. So uh, dedicated devices to treat heavily calcified lesions are essential to stick to the plan A, and IVL is a modern and user-friendly and very effective tool, as we will see later in the, in the next presentations. Just very briefly to show you what I am saying from this meta-analysis of uh, many patients treated with last generation DES, you can see how severe calcifications 
uh, increases the risk of uh, very hard endpoints like death and in my by three folds compared to patients without calcium. So this is very important to tackle. Then, as we said, if point one and three are respected, the patient will live longer and will experience an improvement on his or her quality of life. Successfully, I would say physiologically complete revascularization. I am saying that because there is no way to waste time and augment risk of a procedure just to open occluded arteries that do not um, uh, give blood to viable myocardium, then the patients will survive longer and will have a better quality of life. And this, of course, will translate into less hospital readmissions and less healthcare cost. So I'd like to quote Benjamin Franklin, which was really a genius and the father of the American country, to remember you two key points. An ounce of probation is worth a pound of cure. And if you fail to plan, then you are planning to fail. That means that preventing complications, rather than running after the complication and to fix them, is the key when we manage with these challenges patients. And therefore, adequate planning using the right devices is what we want to share with you as the key message of this session. Thank you. And we now go on to uh, Dr. Benjamin Hunter Horton to uh, give us the highlights of the Disrupt CAD clinical studies. Over to you, Benjamin. Thank you so much, uh, friends and colleagues. It's my pleasure to share with you the highlights from the Disrupt CAD trigger. So you know that uh, IVR have been developed through uh, the Disrupt clinical programs, which include the CAD1, which was the first in man, the CAD2, which was a post-market European registry, the CAD3, which was the pivotal study, and the CAD4, which was developed for uh, Japanese population. And so if we focus on the Disrupt CAD 3, you can see that uh, in this prospective uh, worldwide study that there is 384 patients included in the intention to treat population, AVD calcified lesion, uh, de novo lesion, and 100 have an OCT sub-study. And the major endpoint of this study was a primary safety endpoint, which was freedom from MACE, defined as cardiac death, MI, or TVR but also a procedural success with a, a successful stenting without the residual stenosis more than 50% and without in-hospital maces. And if we focus on angiographic characteristics, we can see that this core lab analysis, we are dealing with very calcified lesion and complex lesion. Length of calcification, nearly 50 millimeters, seven cal service calcification in all the patient. And which is very interesting is that predilatation occurs in half of the cohort only before IVL. The mean IVL pulses were nearly 70%, and interestingly, only 20% of the cohort has a post-IVL dilatation before stenting. The primary safety endpoint was reached in 92.2%, and because it was a single arm study, the FDA uh, ask for a comparison from a predicate study, which was Orbit 2, and you can see it was much more higher in terms of safety. And this safety is mainly driven by periprocedural MI. You can see that 30-day MACE was 7.8% and mainly driven by all MI with a very low cardiac death and TVR at 30 days. If we focus on primary effectiveness endpoint, it was procedural success was reached in 92.4%. And the OCT uh, substudy gave very insight, uh, very useful insight on mechanism of IVL. You can see that there is a, a, a progressive improvement of the MLA uh, after IVL, but also after stents, which suggests that uh, IVL effect is much far beyond the only acute human gain and it increased the vessel capillance. And you can see a, a very surprising stent expansions, nearly 100% in all the patient. But I think the key features from OCT substudy is calcium fracture. You can observe calcium fracture in only two thirds of the cohorts. So does it mean that IVL failed? Certainly not, because when we compare 
the presence of fracture and no fracture, that there is consistent outcome in terms of angiographic results, MSA, stent expansion, and MLA between the two subgroups. It suggests, and it's, it has been very nicely shown by Remy Vermani, that IVL induce micro fractures and not macro fractures, which are beyond the scope of OCT. And probably there is fracture with that not in the plane of the OCT. If we focus on the Japanese population with the discrete CAD4, it was mainly the same protocol that the CAD1, 64 patients including in eight centers. And the baseline characteristics are quite similar than the CAD1. Maybe there is more diabetic patient in the CAD4, but which is very interesting is that the procedural aspects are very different. You can see our colleagues, Japanese colleagues make nearly 100 IVL pulses by patients. And there is only one patient of the cohort who underwent a post dilatation after IVL. But when they compare with a propensity match analysis to the CAT3 study, there is no difference in terms of safety endpoint and effective endpoint. And so far, one of the major advantages of the uh, clinical program disrupt is the homogeneity of the protocol, of the inclusion criteria, but also in terms of, of endpoint. And it allows the comparison and the pool data analysis, which have been recently published by Kariakis and all the friends. 628 patients, you can see we are dealing with very complex lesion, bifurcation involved in nearly 30% of the case. The mean number of pulses when you pull all the data is 74, uh, mainly driven by the CAT3 study but you have a very low post ivl dilatation and I think it's an important point for discussion, but also a, a, a very few rate of stent implanted, nearly 1.3% that you know that the other tools, analysis technique uh, with calcified lesion in more than two stent in, in case of atherectomy. But I think that the main point is consistency. You can see that through the different study, you have uh, in hospital maze, which are quite homogeneous, 6.5% in the pool analysis, but also in the 30 days maze and in the procedural success across the world. Another key point, I think, is safety. And it's amazing that you can see the low angiographic complication in nearly 600 patients. You have only 0.2% of perforation, of perforation despite complex disease and lesion, you don't have any no refill, which, uh, which showed, which suggests that IVL is a very safe procedure. Another thing, we are talking about the cumulative IVL effect and the pool analysis confirmed this impression. You can have an increase of the MLA day after IVL, but also after stent. And it confirmed that IVL effect uh, concerning an acute gain of the lumen, but also vessel complaints. And finally, which is very interesting, that the pool analysis uh, can identify some independent predictor of 30 day maze or procedural success. And definitely, if you have a bifurcation lesion, if you have a prior myocardial infection or a latent lens more than 10 millimeters, you will underwent more 30 day mazes. And in terms of procedural success, bifurcation lesion and prior MI impaired the success of procedure with IVL. So to conclude, I want to share with you that 220 was a successful year for IVL. There is no doubt concerning the safety of this kind of procedure, but also a consistent result across the world despite uh, heterogeneity of the population. We have identified some uh, predictor factor for MACE, and we need to highlight these results according to all commerce data coming from registry in the real life who are coming in the next months and year. Thank you for your attention. That was great uh, talk, Benjamin. And truly, uh, Ivy has been one of the greatest additions to our momentorium for dealing with this nemesis of interventional cardiologists, as we call it, the heavily calcified complex lesions. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this data, and I want you to clarify that for our audience, is the fact that uh, two thirds of the patient on the OCT imaging demonstrated calcium fractures, but one third didn't. And yet we got some good MSAs, even in those patients. So what is the explanation around this? Is, is, is seeing fractures a must? Is that what we're going to be looking at as a success of the procedure? 
Yeah, it's a very good point, very important point. I think if you don't have fractures, it is not a failure of IVF. Uh, it has been perfectly shown, you know, you told that there is a consistent effect on the outcome. And uh, we have shown on micro CT analysis that there is micro fractures uh, which occur in the, uh, on the calcium uh, beyond the uh, scope of OCT, beyond the resolution of the OCT. So it's an important feature. The other one uh, is that the possibility that, uh, as you know, that IVL creates multiplying longitudinal fracture. And so far, uh, you can have some fracture which are not on uh, the plane of the OCT. That's the two uh, main explanations. Right. You know, one of the things uh, about the CAD data, which is, uh, which is an important data because it was meant for approval of the device, uh, the CAD-3 was especially for United States, and of course, CAD-4 is for, uh, for Japan. Uh, but these are select patients, aren't they? Uh, while they were long, they were not necessarily very severe because the percentage diameter stenosis mean was around 65%. Now, in real life, is, there a, is it difficult to deliver this device across a really tight, long lesions? Is there a greater failure of device delivery than what was seen in the CAD data? Yeah, absolutely right, Ashok. Uh, definitely, this, this population is highly selected and does not represent our daily life. Um, and uh, this is the advantage of the uh, CAD uh, trial is to have a homogeneous population, but it is weakness because uh, it's not allow uh, our daily practice with the same features. I want to say that in the French registry national, we have a very high percentage of procedural success and a very low uh, rate of failure to deliver IVL, even in uh, all commerce patient. But it's something that we have to highlight with national data coming from Italy, coming from UK, coming from France. And we have to compare these results according to the disrupt clinical trial results. And I would say that there's no, there's no harm in pre-dilating a lesion to get the device. It's not a failure of the device in any way. In fact, it often works better if you pre-dilated the lesion because it gives the balloon time to open up and the emitters to fire not on an unexpanded balloon, but actually fire uh, on the saline uh, co contrast mixture. I think that's been a great discussion. Uh, we're going to proceed to the next talk because we just discussed real life cases. And I would now uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. KK Yo to discuss about uh, calcium treatment and IVL with IVL in the Asian population. And he's going to talk about some real life uh, data, real world cases. Over to you, KK. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seth. Um, my name is uh, KK Yeo from the National Heart Center, Singapore. Um, I have some disclosures as shown here. Uh, well, we have heard uh, from uh, Benjamin that the shockwave therapy is a game changer with uh, the use of um, these shockwaves that delivers effectively 50 atmospheres of pressure to crack the underlying calcium plates in a very severe disease. And we have heard about the CAT studies. Uh, and this is a description, as I present here, some of our early data from the use of the IVL therapy in Singapore. I would like to first provide some background to interpret what data I'm going to share. First, that uh, when IVL was first deployed in Singapore, its use was limited for financial reasons. And the therapy was only available for those who failed standard therapy or who had severe calcification on intravascular imaging. And because of these two concerns acting in concert, many of the cases that I will share are salvage situations. Um, so this is a paper that we published uh, earlier this year in a uh, journal of invasive cardiology. This is a real world experience, a single center, all comers. And you will see that we had divided the study into three groups. The first were those with primary IVL therapy, and these were in de novo lesions. There were 23 such uh, lesions. The second secondary uh, was in those in whom non-compliant balloon dilatation failed. And the third, the tertiary group, were those that we used the IVL in under-expanded stents. Uh, when we look at these uh, patients together, I just want to highlight, and you can see the red arrows, that the vast majority uh, 
um, more than two thirds had severe calcification, uh, according to the definition by Gary Mintz in 1995, and that the lesions were largely concentric, again, meeting the kind of patients that the IVL therapy was supposed to address. And if you look at the kind of uh, um, success or complication rates, well, first clinical success was achieved in 90% of all patients that we treated, um, and then geographic success in 94%. And if you look at in-hospital maze, this was uh, approximately 6% in just three patients. And when we reviewed the cases, the majority were not in those, um, were not because of the IVL therapy. Um, we now have uh, an example here, which is on the tertiary uh, group in, in this particular study. That is, uh, I think, quite a good example of an underexpanded stand. This was a colleague's uh, procedure in the middle of the night in an acute ST elevation MI. And, uh, you know, there was a massively underexpanded stand that uh, did not work despite OPN balloon. And, uh, you know, I thought I was going to have to rotoblade through the stand, but uh, luckily with uh, IVL, I was able to uh, resolve this particular nasty underexpanded stand. We have now more data. This is data from the Heart Center uh, from January 2020 till May this year. And we had about 105 patients in this registry. Uh, this registry was mandated uh, because uh, of the nature of the approval that we had for the device. So we had to collect data anyway. Um, and I'll just highlight a few key points. Now, bearing in mind uh, Dr. Seth's comments about the um, the fact that uh, this was, uh, you know, this is perhaps in a, in a disrupt CAT study, that patients were not quite real world. I guess this helps address some of those concerns. You will see 71% were diabetics, uh, were diabetic patients, and 20% were on dialysis. The patients on dialysis were, of course, excluded from the disrupt tree study. And if you look at the uh, uh, presentation, uh, we had 13% um, with an ST elevation MI and 25% with non ST elevation MI. Again, highlighting the real world nature of this data. In terms of results, um, uh, we will see, well, before we get to results, you will appreciate that we used other calcium modification therapy in combination with uh, shockwave uh, IVL. Uh, and in this uh, instance, about 22% had rota rotational atherectomy. Um, the angiographic success was uh, 98% and the clinical success was 93%, highlighting the, uh, the safety um, and, uh, of this particular therapy. Now, um, the next slide shows the uh, MACE uh, in our cohort of uh, all comers, about 10% had MACE, and at one year, about 25, 26% had MACE. And this is not surprising considering the uh, general uh, poor states of health of these patients, as I showed earlier on. This is a case or one of our cases. I think you can appreciate the severe calcification. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I was called to assist in this case. Uh, we did rotational atherectomy with a 1.5 or 1.75 burr. And we used the uh, shockwave intravascular lithotripsy. We'll just allow the slide some time to move. And this is uh, the shockwave at 3.5 millimeters. And these are the final results. Now, I would say that the results could be more perfect, but frankly, we had thrown everything but the kitchen sink at this patient from shockwave to rotational atherectomy to OPN balloons and everything else. But I want to share that without a therapy like shockwave, we would be likely to be unable to treat this patient adequately. So I'd like to summarize by saying that we are early in our experience in Asia using the IVL uh, therapy but it is clear that uh, shortwave intravascular lithotripsy offers an important and effective adjunctive therapy in patients with severe calcific coronary artery disease. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for these very nice examples. Of course, you are beginning with the therapy and despite that, I think, which is a, a very important information is that the device has practically no learning curve because you managed to use it effectively since the very beginning. And of course, this makes a difference with other calcium dedicated devices, rotationally based, that of course required a much longer learning curve. Uh, is, is, was that your impression also in your team with your colleagues? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, Flavio, it's, um, it's uh, indeed the case. And I want to say that 
um, by having a therapy like the short wave, I was able to avoid um, doing multiple rotational atherectomy uh, runs. Um, and you know, oftentimes with a one, two, five, one, five, at worst a one, seven, five burr, I was able to deliver the uh, short wave balloon and uh, um, perhaps reduce the need to do multiple uh, burr escalations. Um, of course, this is on a case by case basis, but I found that the combination therapy is very effective. Another interesting uh, observation from your, your presentation, KK, is that as Benjamin said before, your data uh, are consistent with, the, with those of, of the trials. I mean, that means that the technology can be uh, used and the same results can be expected, in particular, the low frequency of complications. I mean, uh, this technology, uh, following what Benjamin said before and what you have shown, have practically no risk of perforation or low flow, which are much more common with rotational devices. Was that your experience too? Yes, um, the shortwave uh, uh, therapy is uh, very, very uh, safe. I, I think the only thing to one has to be mindful of is, you know, to your point, if you have a plan A, do your plan A. So if there is a very severe stenosis that you don't think the shortwave balloon can go through, then it might be better to rotor blade first. So that's my philosophy as well. Uh, for subtotally occluded uh, lesions where there's heavy calcification, I will make sure that uh, I try a balloon and if the balloon doesn't work, then I will rotor blade before I put a shockwave in. So I think uh, the presence of such a powerful tool nonetheless has to be accompanied by an equally, if not superior strategic planning for how to use it uh, in wisely. I, I could not agree more. This is exactly what, what I think. I mean, sometimes you need to create a channel inside the calcified vessel to deliver the, the, the shockwave balloon. But it's less clear to me the other way around. How many times it might happen and why you think it might be necessary to apply IVL therapy after rotational atherectomy? How often? Now, that's a good question. We are in the middle of uh, doing an analysis of our data, comparing, uh, you know, shockwave um, with some of our historical data, with just rotational atherectomy. And um, I probably will not be able to answer that question directly yet. I, I would say that because it is barely uh, more than a year since we started it, uh, we are still on a bit of a learning curve. But I want to take the opportunity to highlight that uh, you can see that 20% of our patients have end-stage renal failure. A group of patients that the, the Disrupt CAD trial did not include, but this in our data, it shows that it can be used effectively even in these very uh, difficult to treat calcified lesions in such a you know difficult cohort. So I think that's good news for all our patients. Absolutely. And in these last 10 seconds, I'd like to underline another specific issue, which is the case you showed this uh, acute MI secondary to a terrible underexpansion of the stent in the proximal right. If you should treat this patient with rotablator, I mean, we can do it, but you know this is not the easiest way. It's fascinating how easily you can open this underexpanded stent with IVL, although, as far as I know, it's still um, off-label indication. But in any case, this is a top indication for this technology. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. And uh, I guess, uh, Ashok, if you, are, uh, if you agree, we move to our next speaker. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alaide Kiefo from um, the Hospital San Rafaele in Milan. Hello, Alaide. Hi, Flavio. So it's a pleasure to be with you today, and thanks for the invitation in such an interesting and contemporary session. So my topic is to discuss regarding the importance of hemodynamic support in CHIP uh, patients, when, why, and how. Um, let's start from uh, um, the clinical expert consensus document on PVAD during high-risk PCI that uh, I chaired, uh, and it was a GISA, Italian Society of Interventional Cardiology document endorsed by Spanish and Portuguese uh, uh, society. In this document in uh, 2019, uh, uh, we started to analyze uh, the indication for high-risk uh, uh, 
um, usage of PVAD during high-risk PCI and focusing uh, uh, based on the prior literature on, uh, on the topic on what is an emer non-emergent chip. Uh, clearly, non-emergent chip is a combination, is a combination of patient characteristics together with uh, angiographic characteristics from uh, complex coronary artery disease, and we are talking about multivessel disease, unprotected left main, complex CTO, uh, last remaining conduit, uh, to indeed the uh, clinical characteristics. So patient presenting acutely with decompensated heart failure or patient electively with low uh, uh, ventricular ejection fraction, uh, less than 30%, and also, as I said, the presentation of the patient and the status of the patient when it comes to our attention. So uh, in this document from our society, uh, it was uh, discussed uh, the importance of an art team discussion in this kind of patient. And for patients where there was no cabbage option and indeed was indicated uh, PCI, an elective PCI, uh, it was uh, suggested to look for the femoral axis and suitability of the femoral axis. In that document, in patient uh, with the indication that we discuss uh, priorly and are also rediscussed uh, in, in these slides, uh, in case the femoral axis was not suitable for bigger bone axis, uh, it, it could be indicated or uh, taking into account the usage of intraortin balloon pump. Indeed, in those clinical conditions uh, and in patients with hemodynamic deficit, it was, uh, uh, in, in case the femoral axis was suitable, it was at that time uh, indicated in Pella 2.5, uh, uh, having said that these are, we are talking about 2019 nowadays, indeed. Uh, we Honestly, we don't use... Uh, almost any more Impella 2.5, and we go straight with Impella CP, as it was uh, also indicated in this uh, publication. Uh, in PIT registry, coming from this experience uh, um, with the Italian Society of Intervention Cardiology, I was the, the PI of this uh, registry. We um, analyzed uh, all the patients that uh, were uh, uh, treated or were pre treated with an Impella device either for cardiogenic shock indication or for high risk uh, PCI. Almost uh, the indication in Italy in the time windows that we analyzed were, I have to say, half and half. Half of the patient had the, uh, as an indication cardiogenic shock for the implantation of Impella or high risk uh, PCI. Uh, at that time, this was uh, the largest investigator driven. Um, analysis of impel implantation uh, at the national level endorsed by uh, a scientific society. And in these uh, uh, slides are shown and we are focusing on the high-risk PCI patient 177 just to have an idea of how we were handling this technology uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, most of the patient uh, with an indication for risk PCI had an impella implanted before PCI, 66% uh, of the patient. There was uh, indeed a percentage of 32% during PCI and only one after uh, PCI. Um, other important point of uh, discussion is the usage in this patient also of uh, um, inotropes in 8% of the cases, mechanical ventilation in 17% of the cases. Uh, the length of impella support in hours was 1.5. So most of the patient had the impella took out and removed at the end of the high-risk PCI. Mostly this was due to left main disease or trivessel disease or the usage of rotablator. And these are the in-hospital and one-year outcome. Uh, that rate was uh, uh, quite low considering uh, the, um, the kind of patient that we were treating. And also, we have to say that one-year survival was uh, aligned with the uh, very high-risk clinical profile of, uh, of this patient. And as a composite endpoint, we took the endpoint of that hospital 
hospitalization for heart failure and need for LVAD or heart transplantation. And this occurred in um, almost 30% of, of the patient. Um, other important subgroup analysis from uh, this uh, registry were the sub-analysis of timing of intel implantation. Even in high-risk uh, PCI, there was the impact of uh, positioning before of the PCI on the major adverse cardiac event as well as uh, on uh, all-cause death when the analysis was uh, adjusted. And this is, I think, a very important message. Not only in shock, it's important to implant before PCI, but also in high-risk PCI, there is an advantage in clinical outcomes, at least in our series, on pre-PCI implantation. Another sub-analysis from this registry was indeed the, the complete of revascularization. And again, um, it was calculated the revascularization index using the BSJC, uh, BSISJS uh, uh, score, and there was an impact uh, when the revascularization was more complete according to this parameter as uh, when the revascularization was not complete in our studies. And this always having an impella on board. Uh, recently, it has been published, indeed, the, the joint EAPCI ACVC expert consensus document on percutaneous ventricular assist device that uh, I had the honor to, to chair together with Susanna Price on the ACVC side. And uh, uh, in this uh, document, it was discussed, it is discussed, we invite all of you to download the, the document. It is published simultaneously in the Aero Intervention and uh, in the uh, Journal of Acute Care from European uh, Society. Uh, we discussed physiopathology, we discussed the different indications, the management of medication, as well as uh, the winning uh, uh, of the impella and also futility of the devices. However, um, in this uh, presentation, we can discuss uh, the um, temporal trends and the widening of the indication and numbers of impella implanted in Europe nowadays. And it's interesting to observe that uh, still the most uh, used device is indeed the intraortium balloon pump. Um, regarding the high-risk uh, PCI, this is taken from the document. High-risk PCI from the document is a condition uh, that is defined by the concurrent presence of one clinical characteristics, uh, as discussed priorly, and one angiographic characteristics, and intraortin balloon pump. Uh, we did say that actually there is no further indication for usage in iris PCI based on the studies available so far, and indeed uh, um, axial flow pumps such as an impella may be indicated in selected patient as defined for iris PCI. Uh, clearly, the evidence comes from PROTECT2 and other uh, studies. Uh, however, it is ongoing uh, the uh, P4 randomized clinical trial because we have to remember that PROTECT2, the primary endpoint, failed to succeed and indeed there was the signal of the secondary endpoint. And indeed via ECMO there is uh, uh, no indication in the uh, presence of high-risk PCI. This according to the working group of both society. Uh, just uh, an example, I try to be fast, uh, which is an RX PCI for us in Milano. This is a 71-year-old woman, diabetic, hypertension, obesity, prior history of non-ST elevation MI. First, our team decision was cabbage. So uh, even if in Milano we still have patients referred for cabbage, however, only off-pump Lima on LED was performed due to low quality of uh, vein graft claimed by our surgeon post operator sternal wound effect, and the patient was referred again to us after cabbage. And this is uh, the uh, baseline coronary angiogram after the PCI. You see a severely calcified left main lesion that you can better appreciate in this spider view. Right is normal indeed. And uh, this is uh, the lima. It was done very distally with and clearly 
not doing the job that it was supposed to be done. And this is why the patient come to our attention again with angina after cabbage. So procedural plan, pre-impella CP position. This is a patient for us to be protected by impella, IVUS guidance, lesion preparation or severely calcified lesion, they kick crash on left main bifurcation. Uh, this is the impella that was implanted pre-PCI. I'm not going to details of all the procedure, just uh, to tell you that uh, lesion preparation was done with uh, shock wave, it was imaging guided, it was done decay crash, and this is the final angio, and this is the final IVUS uh, images. Uh, gap in the knowledge and future studies. Uh, this is again from the consensus document to AEPCI and CVC. And there is a need of randomized clinical trial demonstrating the benefit of PVAD over standard of care in risk PCI and also the need of large registries. And uh, this was the design, I'm sorry, of PROTECT4. This is the randomized clinical trial that is uh, sponsor driven that will randomize patient with Impella pre-PCI versus uh, standard of care without Impella in very high-risk PCI recruiting in US and hopefully starting soon in Europe. And indeed, uh, it is my pleasure to announce uh, this registry, which is the Protect AO registry, that will be indeed an investigator-driven study endorsed by Italian Society of Intervention Cardiology and we will try to have also the German society that indeed is a large registry uh, looking to high risk PCI that uh, uh, will start soon and we have the approval uh, in these days. So thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Alaide. Very nice talk. And uh, of course, I, I think it's worthy to go into some concepts which might be very useful for our colleagues. This is the reason we, we are here. I will start uh, with one of the basic concepts of, of this session, which is planning your, your strategy, preparing for what should not happen, that is the complication or the hemodynamic crash. And you said it very well, you showed it from the, 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 the slides, that starting the left ventricular support before starting your PCI is much better than the other way around. Would you want to give some hints on that, why this happens? That, of course, might sound obvious, but I think it's one of the most important things to underline. Because in this case, uh, when you have a pre-PCI uh, pre impella implanted, uh, this will give you stability of hemodynamic because we have to consider these are severely diseased patients with low ejection fraction, sometimes three vessel disease. And you need your time to do a proper job because if we want to be competitive with cabbage, we need to do the work uh, uh, carefully and we need time. And we need time to do anything. So the case that I show you, I did not go into details because clearly for a time uh, issue, but uh, what we did there, we had to do eva imag imaging with IVUS uh, several rounds and times. We did uh, first non-compliant balloons inflation and this very severely calcified lesion. Then we did shock wave. Then we did decay crash. I mean, honestly, we can claim that you can do and people do without uh, protection, but if you have protection on board, your hemodynamic hemodynamic is more stable, uh, you can also work most probably on uh, um, helping the kidneys because there are some evidence that I did not discuss regarding the usage of uh, um, contrast media and the uh, importance also of this kind of devices to reduce the risk of IKI. And again, you can do this in a more calm way and carefully. Indeed, uh, what you can have, and we have to discuss the number to treat, because clearly, again, the evidence is still to be clear. Uh, you can have, uh, indeed, without an impel on board, complication. Uh, you can have hemodynamic compromise of the patient, uh, uh, embolic uh, um, uh, embolization of calcium uh, during rotablation. And you have to run to try then to stabilize uh, hemodynamics uh, after that. 
And clearly, this is not uh, optimal, I think, in this kind of patient. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons why there are sometimes, let's say, not very good results after the use of uh, LV support is because we, we, we try to do as much as possible complete revascularization. As you have seen, it's better for the patient. But sometimes it might be that we use uh, we, we perform some, let's say, unnecessary intervention. I'd like to know from Ashok and from Benjamin and from KK if they do regularly all the vessels or in elective cases, you look for viability or for some physiologically guided um, revascularization. I, I should start with Ashok and then I want to hear the opinion of the other two panelists. Clearly, my, my comments, and I think I support Professor Kierfo in this thought process that Firstly, exactly what we have to emphasize, and that is what it does for us is suppose the patient so that we have complete revascularization of all the viable territories, which is what correlates with outcomes. And it's been clearly shown that complete revascularization pertains to better outcomes. Uh, we also must understand that that is what leads to LV function improve, improvement over a period of time, which again helps survival. I was wanted to address two important issues. You see, the decision about putting impeller differs from country to country and based on the cost of the device as well as reimbursement circumstances. And therefore, we do need to develop algorithms for our own countries, scoring systems for our own countries. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask here for that. Have, you know, based on the Italian data, were you able to develop a scoring system, at least for Italy, whereby you would have an appropriate use of the device rather than, you know, an, uh, an arbitrary use of the device. Uh, for example, PA pressures are important. PA oxygen saturations are important. We need to understand those very aspects. Uh, so there are anatomic aspects. There, are, uh, there, there is hemodynamic aspects. And all these get together to form the scoring system. So what about that, uh, for Professor Kiefer? So I think that in Italy we are quite lucky, I have to say, the work done by physicians and also by industry here and <clears> the <throat> government, uh, we have a reimbursement of the device uh, uh, for both indications. And these help us in the usage. And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, Italy and Germany are the countries where uh, the usage of uh, these devices uh, is the largest uh, in all over Europe. And this because it's a combination of research that was done, uh, company, uh, authorities. Uh, and so we have to say that we use, uh, and this is reimbursed. That's an important point because clearly these are expensive devices. So uh, the hospital cannot afford the cost not without being reimbursed, considering also that we do have evidence coming, uh, preliminary evidence, but we don't have randomized clinical trial that put is devising class one recommendation. So that's so, so we did point. create a scoring system for India and use the device regularly based on the scoring system, which many of us got together under the ages of our society to create a scoring system. So I just now want to pass it on to Benjamin. Um, you know, peer pressures, uh, peer saturations, does that figure in your in your in your dis decision making for the choice of uh, impeller use? in LV dysfunction patients. So it's an important point. And as you uh, highlighted, we don't have any reimbursement of Impella in France. So it's a huge limit uh, of accessibility to this important device, as Professor said. And um, that's also in the other end, one thing which is in favor of uh, easy and appealing uh, plaque calcification modification as shockwave, because you know it's safer, more than atherectomy probably, we will have to show it later, but in this kind of very complex and unstable patient, it could be a major advantage when you don't have any uh, support as Impella in France. Well, we are, we are reaching an end of this, uh, I think, uh, I would say very interesting meeting, and just very briefly, underline some important points. As we said, if you select the patient properly, he will uh, uh, have an improvement in his LV function after treatment, especially if the treatment has been done 
achieving complete revascularization. But as we said before, patient selection is very important and performing a good job also. And when we have to perform a good job in calcified lesions, again, this is a different slide compared to the first one, but confirming the impact of severe calcification of the vessels on mortality, infarction, and survival. So to come to an end, I think uh, we, we can conclude that treatment of calcified lesions in cheap patients may create problems. But to quote another smart guy, a clever person solves the problem, a wise person avoids it. I hope you agree with us. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us and that this session has been helpful. Thank you very much, all of you. I hope you enjoyed the session. <clears throat> it was great learning for all of us. I hope it's been a great learning for all of you. Thank you all.